Okay, folks, time to get started. Welcome to the continuing um, webinar that Q analysts give as periodically throughout the year. Today's uh, effort for you is BI as Data Security. I'm Tom Borschelt, your host and presenter for today. Hopefully you'll find it an engaging topic. Uh, it's certainly been in the news lately with uh, data breaches and everything that's going on with, with security. So hopefully this, this uh, foray into how you can use BI as a data security tool uh, will be both interesting and informative for you. So let's get started. Here's me. Uh, I've been uh, doing this kind of work for over 30 years, uh, you know, which which makes me this. Uh, so I have been uh, in in the business of BI, the business of analytics and data, for a, for a long time, and in a lot of places and in a lot of roles. And you can see just the industry list that I'll highlight down here. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter where you are in terms of an industry perspective. It doesn't really matter where you are in terms of a business process. It all comes down to four letters when you're talking about BI and security. And those are the four letters. It's all about data. So uh, when we talk about BI and security, it's what can we do to protect the most important asset that a company has. That's the intellectual property, and that's our customers and our data internally. So we've been doing this for, for 30 years, and QAnalyst is a company that uh, specializes in, in BI as one of our core competencies. And so here we are. What, what does Q actually do? So if you're talking about industries, we cross all industries, whether it's retail, manufacturing, energy, and utilities. And I'm right on this, this line right here that you can see by that arrow. Uh, public sector, banking, insurance, transportation. Telecom, healthcare, life sciences, we're in a lot of different industries because when you come down to it, BI and data, it all works the same. And, and what do we care about in those industries? If you look at the domains that we care about, uh, it's across the terms of customer. And if you're, if you're uh, looking at supply chain, you might care about those sorts of things, supplier, product, and material. No matter what the company, you care about finance. For sure, that's, that's with all companies. And even at the end here, when we say reference, what I mean by reference right there means uh, data as an asset. So we play in a lot of companies. We play in a lot of areas in those companies. And, and what do we really do in BI? We can see the discipline in that next line down right there that we care about. We do things around information governance, data quality, MDM, master data management, we care about data migration, data integration, lifecycle management. All these things are what makes up BI. And specifically, in talking to our clients, and we do this every day, we talk to our clients day in and day out, two things come out as being highlights of the BI, BI practice. That's right here. I'll draw a circle. It's kind of messy, but I'll draw a circle there. That's information governance. It, it comes out as a huge uh, thing that, that companies are struggling with, as well as data integration. Companies don't know how to uh, deal with their data. They don't know who owns it and who's supposed to be responsible for it. And data is coming at them so fast in so many ways, they don't know how to integrate it together to, to drive and, and get a picture of exactly what they want to get. Bottom tier right here, talking about technology. Uh, these are just some of the tools that that we use. There's, there's a long list, and we didn't put all of them in there, but some of the major tools we care about in BI, we, we are, as a company, tool agnostic. We deal with many, many tools. There's a couple hundred BI tools. A few tens of them uh, stand out in Gartner as the major ones, but we deal with all of them. And when it comes down to it, the tool is probably the least important thing uh, we care about, and, and BI should care about. They should care about understanding the data and what's involved there. Okay. A little bit about us. If you look again uh, on this column right here, uh, we do a lot of different things. So that was the, the the previous slide was more or less the what. This, what I'm showing you right here, is really the how. So we do uh, work in a lot of different areas. We can do advisory services along those domains that we talked about before. A lot of that work is advisory. 
a lot of that work is actually tool selection and implementation. And then we'll also operate as an operational service where we can come in and, and really run run a section of it for you. And we have even down to service centers where we'll, we'll uh, take an entire service and just run it uh, as our own for you and, and give you the results. So a lot of people will, will engage us that way. So we, we run the gamut in VI all the way from assessment to project implementation to value creation and, and realization at the back end. So that's a little bit about who we are and, and how we operate as a VI practice. But what we want to do is actually get into the meat of, of this. And if you think about what, what's happening with big data, here's, here's big data right here in the center of this circle. And really, big data is at the heart of everything. And this is really the perfect storm. Uh, never in my 30 plus years uh, have I seen uh, an event or a series of events take place like this. You've got machines that are incredibly fast and capable and that are not cheap to deploy. You've got tools that make analysis so much better and the networks to carry it. So I've, I've never seen a, a phenomenon like this. And, and, and if you look at this whole cycle here, then it really is a cycle about what customers and what clients go through. Um, customer support uses big data. Customer support, you better believe Amazon knows uh, what you bought, when you bought it, how much you bought. And in fact, on the web page, they'll tell you customers who bought this also bought this. So the ability for Amazon to support you as a customer using big data is huge. Social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, of course, using big data. It's all about the connections and the multiple connections you can make. Big data has a role in, in uh, business improvement and, and efficiency. And some role, the role we're going to talk about today, which hasn't really come out uh, lending itself as well as big data as it should, is the security analysis piece of it. Customer profiling is a huge, uh, is a, is a huge uh, event in, in big data. And of course, it's all driven through sales and marketing. And really, what's it all about? It's about these increased profits that are coming in. And what happens when you do this? All of a sudden, you hit this big stop sign here. So as the big data is rolling out and people are using it, all of a sudden, the more data there, the more uh, ability there is for a data breach or a theft to occur. The government recognizes that, and that's driving regulation, and that's putting a giant stop sign in business moving forward. Businesses today and our clients are so fearful of having data breaches that they really don't know how to stop it well. Uh, and that's what today's talk is all about, is you can talk about your traditional ways to stop incursions into your systems, but nobody really talks about using BI as an effective tool to stop data breaches. And that's what we're going to discuss a little today. So here's, here is, in fact, the perfect storm. Uh, it's really a time bomb of how things are coming together. Big data deployments growing fast. Uh, ROI is in focus. And unfortunately, in, in when, you when you talk about big data, big data was meant, and the tools in big data are meant to get data out in such a way that it's easy to get out, it's easy to deal with, and easy to understand. It's not meant to be secure. It's not engineered to be secure. So security is not a huge part of the big data strategy. It's starting to be uh, employed more and more be because of all the data breaches. But inherently, things like Hadoop and all those other big data tools are not engineered to be secure. And that creates a problem. A bigger problem, perhaps, is that next bullet point. A shortage in big data skills. Uh, it is a new uh, type of uh, uh, talent or and set of things that are need, needing to be done in order to work with big data. There's a, there's a shortage. It's relatively nascent, maybe five, six years old. The skill sets needed to deal with big data are just now coming online. And if someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm an expert in, in big data, I would treat that with a fair amount of a grain of salt, only because it hasn't been long enough for anybody to be an expert in it. And again, as we, as we had mentioned, the security solutions are not effective. If they were effective today, you wouldn't see all these data breaches that are happening. And there's a shortage in skill sets for security as well. Uh, not only is there a shortage in big data skills, there's a shortage in security skills as well. 
So uh, the perfect storm has come together where the machines and the data are far outstripping our ability to, to essentially protect ourselves as a company. All right, well, where's, where's that threat coming from? You can really think of it uh, in this Venn diagram. It's coming from, from three different places. So up here at the top, you've got these cyber criminals, uh, and they are financially motivated. All they want to do is break in, get get the data, and somehow either use blackmail or sell the data to uh, some nefarious groups, somehow make money off this, off this process, and that's what they're trying to do. You can have a second group of landscape threats out there, and those are really the state-sponsored hackers, and they're nationalistically motivated, right? They care about moving their nation forward. And if you look at one nation who is the worst offender at data breaches, it's just drawing on the screen now, that is it. And I'll show you some statistics. Uh, nationally motivated state-sponsored hackers, uh, you're talking about China for the most part. The third landscape threat down here on the bottom left are what we would call the hacktivists. They're politically motivated. They think they can have a better world if they just release all the data into the public domain. Uh, Anonymous comes to mind, Edward Snowden comes to mind, uh, and that's really uh, really what they're all about, is trying to, make, trying to make a better world. So here you've got that threat landscape, and in the intersection of that Venn diagram, right here in the center, um, highly technical, bad stuff in, good stuff goes out. And that's really what's happening there. Uh, they're, they're getting in and getting away with all sorts of stuff that, that you'd be surprised at. So here's some, here's some uh, stats I wanted to show you guys. It's, it's uh, interesting and sobering at the same time. So what do we have here across the X? We've got essentially a time axis going across the top here like this. And so you've got seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and here you've got two points that you want to measure, initial attack to compromise. In other words, how long does it take them to actually get in and get something from when they first think they want to and try? How long does it take to be discovered? Well, the problem is, in this timeline, this 84% right here, it takes, on average, only a matter of hours for a talented hacker to get in and, and see the stuff that they want to get to. So hours, within hours of first trying, they're in. And the bad part of that is the initial compromise. How long does it take to get discovered? Almost the same number, a little less, 78%. So the way you read this, 84% of the attacks happen within hours, and yet it takes years to months for that to be discovered. So right now, there is some company out there that is undergoing, many companies out there, undergoing hacks. They're losing data right now, and they won't know it for months. So that, that is a pretty sobering threat. So what has to happen in the industry is this top initial attack has to move in this direction, that's the way we want that to move. It takes them longer to get in, and this bottom one has to move in this direction. We've got to, we've got to get that compromise to discovery. We've got to find out about it faster. Okay. So who, when a breach happens, uh, how are they discovered? Well, up here in this first one, you can see that area a little bit right there, maybe. Uh, it's about 58%. So law enforcement, law enforcement notifies companies that they've been hacked. 58% of the time. Third-party detection comes in at around 25%. Uh, worst of the worst, your customer tell you they've been hacked. What have you done to my data? Uh, the actual hackers themselves may make it known. And now you're getting into the rarefied air of 1% to 2% down here that says, oh, how else do we find that we've been hacked? Well, internal fraud and detection, financial audit, reconciliation, log analysis, unusual system behavior performance, all this stuff, this stuff is external up here. All this stuff down here is internal. We've got to flip that chart. We've got to move the way that hacks get identified from being external to being internal. So these guys got to come up here, and hopefully these drop down there. That means that when, when breaches are discovered, we discover them internally first. Someone doesn't come and tell us about it. And that's really where this has to go. Right now, third party, the government tells us, law enforcement agents tell us, we don't know about it until they tell us. And that's part of what's driving that seven month or so average to be discovered, because we're waiting for external 
external entities to tell us we can hack. So we've got to flip that one as well. So how do you try and protect yourself? Well, typically, the typical countermeasures over the last 10 years have been involved at the fringes of the infrastructure, at the routers, at the firewalls, things like that. So and on this pinwheel of stuff, you see, you know, post firewall there at about 3 o'clock sign, or about the 5 o'clock window, you've got anti-spam, you've got URL filtering, maybe some next generation firewalls coming in. So the, the typical ways that companies protect themselves are at the fringes of the company. Again, it's like you've got a castle out there, and the way you've protected yourself is you've built bigger walls, thicker walls that are harder to get into. Yeah, well, how is that work out for us? Not so well, because people are getting in. And really, that, that is the single and only defense that, that I've seen been used dramatically over the last uh, couple of uh, couple of years that, that hacks have really increased, is that they're putting all their efforts in one basket, and that basket is the external part of the firewall. Well, that is really not good enough. And, and what happens if you're, a, if you're a senior level in the company, um, these are questions that no C-level wants to have to ask. So, you know, the CEO, if you're the CEO of Target or Sony or wherever you are, you don't want to be asking these questions. And if you're the chief security officer, you better be ready to answer these questions. You know, who did this to us? That's one of the things. Who, who's getting our information and why? So who did this to us? And, you know, you can follow down the line. Well, how did they do it? Is our, our, our defense is not well enough? Did they come in? Did somebody steal it? Was it somebody on the inside? What are they getting away with? What systems and data was affected by this? Did, did they get our payroll? Did they get our customers? What did they get? And probably most on the minds of, of C-level folks is how can we be sure that it's over? Is it still going on right now? It took us seven months to find it. How do we know it's not happening or someone else isn't there? And then most important at the end, well, it's happened once. How can we make sure that it's not going to happen again? So all these questions that C-level people, whether it's uh, the CEO or CFO or the shareholders even, we're going to be a asking these questions of, of the people in the company and answers have to be found for that. And if all you're doing is is securing your your, uh, your gateways in is not going to be good enough. All right. So remember, we said big data was at the heart. Let's do a little definitional exercise here. So what really what is big data? So everybody talks about big data, but you know, what is it really? So and and again, all, all, everyone's seen this chart. Mankind created data. You can see the data at the broken line is really what it is, but it is really it's almost perfect curve, a perfect asymptotic curve. So data has been almost logarithmically getting bigger since 2005. And the quote that I think everybody knows is 90% um, or 95% of, of all the data created has been created in the last two years. And you can, you can work that statistic you know, multiple of ways. You can either, either vary the, the amount of data or the time. You can say, well, at some point it's going to be 99% in two years. 99.5% in two years, or you can say it's 90% in the last six months, it's 90% in the last three months. However you want to slice it, uh, volume is the key on big data. Big data is named big data for a reason, because it is large. How big? Um, look, you can look at the amount of things, different ways to measure it. You can measure it by tweets, 12 terabytes of tweets. You can measure it by how many RFID cards are in use, radio frequency identification, everything when you buy an article of clothing, there's an RFID tag and that gets measured. How many mobile phones out there? Right now, the stat might be a little old, 6 billion mobile phones. What's the population of the world? Roughly 7 billion. Um, that's, that's a lot, one for every person just about. Here's the big, here's the biggie. Log data, machine to machine is the biggest part of big data. Terabytes of machine talking to machine, whether it's a security camera talking to something or logs being taken, whatever it is, it is really, really uh, a huge volumetric. So when everybody thinks about big data, the first B word that comes to mind is, of course, volume. My favorite, favorite slide of this talk, uh, just to get you an idea of how big is big, what happens in an Internet minute? Um, 
$400 million. I'll, I'll highlight this one down here. $400 million uh, Alibaba peak day sales. $400 million a day in Alibaba. 1.5 million gigabytes of global IP data transferred. If you want to think about it in times of photos uploaded every minute, every minute to the web, 38,000 or so photos get uploaded every minute. Google, 4.1 million searches every minute. And probably one of the biggest ones you're looking at YouTube and uh, Netflix down here. Here's the, here's the interesting stat on YouTube. Every minute, every minute, there's 138,000 hours of video watched every minute. Mobile traffic is huge. By 2017, mobile traffic will have grown 13 times its current size in 2012. 2017, there's going to be three times the amount of devices than there are people on Earth. How many people on Earth? Roughly, roughly 7 billion. 21 billion connected devices by 2017. So big is, in fact, but there's four dimensions, right? There's four dimensions of, of, of big data. We talked about the first one, which is really volume. But there's also velocity. So it's not just how big is it, which is data at rest. It's data in motion. How fast is it coming at you? And it is coming at you fast. It's streaming a lot in milliseconds. Algorithmic programming trading alone is streaming tons of data to you in milliseconds. Another of the V words that gets thrown around is variety. Data is in many forms. It's structured, as in you know, think of databases as a structured field. It's unstructured, text, multimedia, pictures, movies, it doesn't matter. Big data is anything that you can actually store. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to something known as veracity or truth. So not all data is valuable, depending, you know, despite what people like me and see years in the business of storing data. Not all data is worthwhile. Not all data is true. But until you can find out what's true and what's not true or what's valuable and not valuable, you have to store it anyway. So there's data and doubt. So when you talk about big data, it really it really has multi-dimensions and you can, you can express it in the way of these four views. So it's huge. It's coming at you fast. There's all kinds of variety and you don't know whether any of it's true. Um, that makes it, that alone makes it pretty tough to talk about securing this don't really know what you're dealing with. So if you kind of break down big data, what is it mostly? Well, mostly, and, and what companies really care about, it's mostly customer-centric. It has to do with the customer. Fully 50% or in this stat, 49% is based on customer-level information because companies are in the business of, of you know, selling products, services, whatever. And one of the major items of data they have, their master data, is their customer list. And they want to know everything about you as a customer, what you buy, what you don't buy, uh, when you buy it. Uh, it's all about making, making their business more effective by um, optimizing that share of wallet that they're going to get from you. And it, it is, and, and people like Netflix, if you, if you talk about that, or Amazon, Alibaba, any of those things, they're all around making it more effective, uh, making their, their uh, marketing efforts more effective and understanding their customers better. Okay. Well, we talked about big data, but how is it different from normal data? The only reason we call it big data is because we're not that good at dealing with it. It should just be called data. So why is it really different? Different architecturally, right? For a couple of reasons. Uh, what makes it really interesting is that it's not in isolation. It's data that's connected to each other. So it's like a neuron in the brain. It's connected to millions of other neurons. So uh, there's there's a few TED Talks out there that deal with the interconnection of data and why it is structurally different from, from anything else. And again, we talked about no security. Inherently, big data and the tools developing that are developed to deal with big data, they are not based. Uh, on security, it's all about getting data out and not getting, you know, not not uh, keeping people from getting data out. 
it's different operationally. Uh, it's so large, so fast moving. There's a lot of people that have a lot of access to it. So the insider to a company has a lot of access and has access to more data than, than ever before. Used to be the ledgers of a company were all kept in a sealed system and only the CFO and a few people had to take a, were able to take a look at it. Only the marketing folks could look at look at the customer list and what that meant. It just wasn't practical to give people access to that volume of data. You just couldn't do it. Now it's very, very easy to give lots of people access to lots of data. And it's different operationally for another reason. Uh, audit and logging. Everything is audited. Everything is logged. So yes, there were data breaches in the past, but now we have the ability through audit and logging to detect them better. So that's kind of diff that's why it's different than just your traditional view. So big data security is a big problem for those reasons. So what 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 do you you know what what's going on out there? So um, everybody recognizes this site, I'm sure. Ashley Madison, right? Big in the news lately. They've had their data breach. Uh, you know, if you want to think of a moniker for this, hey, this time it's personal, right? And it really is. So, uh, you know, everybody knows what this site is. It's, it's an adultery website. And uh, I'm sure uh, they, they claimed that they were going to secure their data, but guess what? Uh, the hackers got in, and I'm sure they are the hacktivists. In other words, they are thinking they can make the world a better place by making all this data known. So uh, everybody who signed up for this site, they're all plastered all over the web. And I read, an, I read a, a news blurb the other day that said there's only three zip codes in the United States that aren't represented by a customer somewhere in this Ashley Madison data set. So that's all on the website. Um, I'm sure people are going in there trolling to see if there's anyone they know. But the makers of this site are now being sued, as you might guess, um, for, uh, for letting this data breach happen in violation of their security uh, principles. And, and in all things that happen, with, with companies and data and things like this, the lawyers always win. Let's take a look at one that's a little bit old, but it's really, really interesting. Um, this happened probably a little more than a year ago. Um, Target, everyone knows Target. Most people probably shopped at Target. They had a huge data breach. 70, the data from 70 million people got hit in that data breach. So we're going to take a look at some stats about what that might mean to a company financially. But this was a, a huge problem because people's credit cards are, are now out, out there on the web. And after all this data came out, first the CIO was fired. Uh, and I have a little bit of, of sympathy for the CIO because at that level, they get so many threats uh, put before them each day, it's hard to know which ones to take seriously and which ones to not take seriously because they don't have the tools to tell them that. But regardless of that, at the end of the day, the buck stops there in the, in the data world. So the CIO was fired because of this. And it was such a huge problem for the company. Eventually, the CEO was fired because of this. And basically, the company had to do that because as officers of the company, they have a fiduciary responsibility. Probably lucky they didn't wind up going to jail. But uh, you know, so at this point in time, things like this are of huge interest to companies, not just because of the lost goodwill and sales, but just raw loss uh, to their business, and it is a business killer. These, these breaches are business killers. Sony. The reason I bring up Sony is because, uh, you know, kind of like their movies and stuff, but they didn't do a good job at securing their data. So hackers got into Sony, so what did Sony do that uh, was really egregious? Well, they have HR data in the, in the form of salary on there, and they have health care data on some of their employees, and by employees I mean movie stars in some cases. So part of it was, in Sony's case, they actually put um, a spreadsheet out there on the web that wasn't even password protected. Now, it's, it's extremely easy to break Excel passwords, extremely easy, but it, it, you know, it, it is a line of defense. So Sony actually put their healthcare data uh, from various people in the company, both famous and non-famous, in a spreadsheet that hackers got a hold of. And so it's, it's yet to be seen exactly what Sony is going to have to uh, do in terms of making it a, a more secure place. But that's another example of, of why people get in. And I think in this case, it wasn't a hacktivist as, as much as it was uh, for financial purposes, blackmail, all that sort of thing. 
So who's sponsoring these attacks? Well, uh, if you look at the, the recent uh, Akamai data from the, the second quarter 2015 that just came out, these denial of service attacks, again, I wrote it in, in text on an earlier slide, the biggest, the biggest uh, entity of doing these attacks is, is of course, China, you know, followed by right here in the U.S. and then ongoing. Um, these denial of service attacks are a way of blasting out uh, to just increasingly stop businesses from actually operating. These days, if, you, if your website's down, you're effectively shut off, especially for people like, like Amazon and, and Google, whose, whose actual revenue is, is tied to that presence. And the way they do it is they, they, they have an extremely powerful network and just hammer the website uh, with, with a, uh, just a boatload of attempts. And the only, the only effective uh, entities that can actually mount a, an attack of that size are, are governmental agencies. So China is, is responsible for 37% of the hacks against that. What was surprising to me is that I actually thought Russia uh, would be a bit higher, but they only come in at about 4 and a half. So again, here's the government entity that we talked about from that triad of, of bad actors trying to get in, and mostly in this case, it's, it's from China. But who's being targeted? You look at Q1 in the blue, you look at Q2 in kind of the orange color. Uh, what surprised me in looking at this statistic, uh, didn't surprise me too much down at the bottom here, that software and technology would be a big target uh, what surprised me, at least initially, was the biggest one here, the gaming industry. And so, and I thought, well, why is that? But then, obviously, you know, a few seconds later, it occurred to me, if you think about what happens in the gaming industry, online poker, now you're talking about dollars that are spent freely over the web, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a, a large, uh, in terms of all the, the company's data, or all the companies' dollars that are out there, but it, Online gaming is a huge industry. The dollars are out there. You often people put their credit card in and play video book or whatever games they play. That is a ripe target uh, for hacking. So if I were in the gaming industry, who knows how long it's going to be before any casino comes in and decides that they want to have an online gaming. That, that's going to have to be secured extremely well in order to protect that data. So the gaming industry, the, it's large, but it's about the same Q1 to Q2. Okay, and again, the, uh, the, the governmental entities that, that uh, attack are the, are the largest attack. And interestingly enough, and I don't know how they did it, but the uh, U.S. government was able to determine that was a Chinese army unit seen as, as tied to hacking against the U.S. So I thought that was a huge, a huge uh, uh, interesting uh, note. But then you look at how it was the APT-1 group. And then you look at the actual size of what they did. Uh, they compromised 141 companies, this one unit, over 20 industries. And they stole hundreds of terabytes of data, uh, technology blueprints, proprietary manufacturing, you know, test results, business plans, and of course in the news, in the political arena, what, what could have potentially happened out there? Emails from high government officials. Uh, those potentially the most damaging uh, things that could be released then when, uh, when, when foreign governments get a hold of uh, secure emails, uh, who knows what can happen after that. So it's, it's um, very bad. Hacktivism, again, here we're talking about anonymous. And who do you, you know, of, of the people you would expect to be hacked, wouldn't, wouldn't be the CIA and Interpol, but they have been. Uh, but late, lately in the news, we've seen various governmental agencies being hacked. So uh, the people that are out there perpetrating these crimes are extremely sophisticated. They're extremely competent. And again, the current way to protect is to just beef up your 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 uh, firewalls and the, the outer part of the network. The incidents over time uh, are increasing, right? And here's data to, up into 2012. And you'll notice, of course, you've got a blip in the timeline right here between 2008 and 2009. What happened? Well, mini recession or the stock market crash, whatever you want to call it. Uh, companies were in free fall, and so actually the amount of hack attacks decreased, which is an interesting stat. 
you ask yourself, well, how can this happen? You know, we've talked about all these hacks and everything, but why, why is this happening? Again, you have to look at, at big data and how it's put together. So what you have here is a schematic of, of how big data more or less sits uh, on the servers. So at the very bottom, you have, in fact, Hadoop, nothing more than a Hadoop distributed file system. Of course, you've got, in most cases, MapReduce sitting on top of that, which is a way to uh, bring all those queries back into a single, uh, a single uh, result set. And you've got all the tools that you want to think about that, that layer on top of that. So what happens is you've got multiple entry points. In the old days, we just had a database. There were only a number of ways in, and they were very secure. Now, with open websites, mobile plays, and everything that's going out there, the ways to get into a company have just exploded. Hence, the ways of bad actors to get in have just exploded as well. And again, this is this is a big data uh, schematic, and big data is built to, to get data out, not to secure data, and that's what it was built for. All right, so we talked about a number of ways that a company uh, can, can lose data, but what's really, what does it mean in terms of dollars and cents? What is the cost of a data breach? So, if you look in, in uh, the Ponemon, which is from IBM, um, and you can look at some of the data, it's a little bit tough to read, but I'll walk you through it a bit. Uh, so, on the vertical piece here, we've got, the vertical slide, we've got countries listed, U.S. all the way down. And then you've got some time frames in the green, you've got 2013 in the red, 2014 in the blue, 2015. So, this actual number here that you're looking at, this 217 right there, that is not 1,000, that's not million. The actual number is $217, and it's per capita. What does that mean? Per capita down here is defined as the cost of a data breach by the number, divided by the number of records, number of lost records. So this is the cost for every record lost to a company. And in the U.S., in 2015, every record, that doesn't say what kind of record, but every record that is lost is potentially worth $217. Doesn't sound like much until you think back a little bit to Sony. At the very least, at the very least, even if there was one record and that had customer data on that one record, they lost 70 million records at the very least. So that's 70 million times $217 per. You can do the math. Billion here, billion there, pretty soon it adds up to real money. So why is the U.S. why is the U.S. leading in this problem here? Again, follow the money. That's where all the money is in these U.S. companies. So, and that's where most people are, are working to actively disrupt things. Trend in regulations, again, and that's from, remember from that big stop sign, all is well and good. We're, we're working as a company. Our big data is helping us. Until these breaches occur, the government throws up a big red stop sign saying, hang on, we've got to do something, and that something is regulation. In this case, we're talking about eight, the HIPAA laws, uh, medical data that has to be uh, that is private, PHI is private health information. Penalties if you don't encrypt that, big penalties. So if you kind of read all the way down into this paragraph down here, there's steep penalties for a data breach and that's up to 1.5 million per breach. And that doesn't mean, oh, uh, Aetna, United, whatever the health company, insert your favorite, lost a million records in a breach. That's not one. Uh, when you're talking PHI, that's individual. So that's 1.5 million for every individual person breach. That's a huge amount. This is a company breaker. This is why healthcare companies are extremely nervous about all this data going out there and Lost because the government will slap pretty steep fines on that. Uh, I can't imagine what Sony is going to have to pay for this. All right, we've been doing this for 40 minutes here. So great. So all the all the stuff we've been talking about. The solution is finally here. I'm going to tell you how to fix all your ills. Whoop. There's an asterisk there. Um, well, you know, sort of. Uh, it's sort of. A there really is no silver bullet. There really is no one thing you can do. Uh, but in, in trying to figure out how to fix this type of stuff, there's a, we have to harken back to the earlier days of BI 
FBI, and again, I've been doing this for 30 years, uh, we were, oddly enough, much more secure in decades past uh, with our information than we are today. It's so much easier to get the data today, uh, whether it's something that gets shot to your PC or you pick it up on your mobile phone, whatever. It's the, the access to data is so easy that we don't, didn't have a concurrent rise in the protection of that data from a BI perspective, from a BI perspective. So the big data platform, as we know, may not be secure, but your information can. So think about what I, what I just said there. And here's, here's a quote from Sue in the Art of War. You can ensure the safety of your defense only if you hold positions that cannot be attacked. All we need to do is throw something odd and unaccountable in his way. So what we're going to throw in uh, the hacker's way is a BI uh, implementation that it, it can't deal with. And so what do I mean by that? And what I mean is that the barbarians are at the gate here. They're going to breach the wall because they are and they have been. And once they breach the wall, that's all companies do for the most part to protect their data. What we need to make sure of is when the barbarians breach that wall and they get into the treasure room and, and pry open that vault, what they find is useless to them. Not useless to us, but useless to them. So they, they're, they're going to break in. We know that's going to happen. But how do you protect your data once that happens? And BI can be the key to that. So big data has to prepare for that changing landscape. So what, what's one thing we can do in BI that will help us help us protect? Well, let's encrypt. We can encrypt our data in such a way that unless you have the right key, the right tool, the right BI login with its appropriate security, anything you see in terms of data is just meaningless. Uh, go back to the Sony example. When you have a spreadsheet and it's unencrypted, anybody that has a copy of Excel or Google Docs can read that. Now, had they just encrypted that and made it uh, key-based, key with 128-bit or more encryption on top of that, they would have gone on, you know, the hackers would have gone on to the next thing, right? The fact that, uh, oddly enough, uh, if you put the signs around your house that says protected by whatever security, a lot of times you don't get broken into because they'll just go to the next available house that isn't as well protected. So that's one way to protect your data, just encrypt it, and the BI tools today can handle that. State laws. We're going to have to be more proactive because the fines are huge in that PCI is in the finance industry protected card information. What else can we do in BI? Health data regulation, the need for data segmentation. What we used to do in the olden days is have something called tokenization. You don't need to have a unique identifier. You don't need someone's social security number. There are a few digits out there that are meaningless and don't identify anyone, but yet can still be reported on at a certain level that makes sense. And somewhere deep in the bowels of the organization, when you actually want to reach out to the person or the individual behind that data, that's the data that gets locked down and the, the, uh, the marketing or the advertising folks or whoever actually needs it can then do that encryption, but don't stick it in generic reports. So encrypt it or mask it or do something like that that just doesn't point to, to an individual that way. And these are just good data management techniques that we ignore at our peril. We've got extra sensitive data in there as well. Drug abuse, HIV code, sex abuse, and more. One of the, one of the most important things that people forget in protecting their data is that not all data is of equal value. There's some data out there that you don't need to protect as much as others. Name and address. Yeah, is it is it is it important? Sure. Uh, can, can thieves get it another way? Absolutely. So the amount of vigor that you put into protected name and address, not as much as Social Security, health records, so on and so forth. So part of the problem that, that companies face in, in trying to use this way to protect their data, it's too cost prohibitive. So I would say two things about that. Cost prohibitive in terms of what? The cost of a data breach? How many millions you're going to lose? If prohibition based on the potential loss you could, have, you could have. And second, you only need to do certain pieces of the data, maybe 15% of the total data you have needs to be protected in that way. The rest doesn't have to be. So it's not like you have to take, I've got 10 terabytes of information.
information, don't think you have to protect 10 terabytes. It's something less than that. Ponemon Institute, again, IBM. 61% will solve pressing security issues, but only 35% currently have security solutions in place. That's a horribly low number, horribly low. And yet you have to balance that security and the insight. You can't overprotect things so that it becomes useless to you, right? You, you can overprotect a lot, but internally, if you, if you do that to such an extent that you lose the value of the data, that's not good either. <clears throat> so you have to do um, the appropriate thing. There's always a tug of war between security and data insight. And again, big data is designed for access, not security. De identify those pieces of the data that you think are most important and most secure that should not get out. And the only truly way to protect data is to do it at the data level. And that means atomic. People will argue, oh, we can't protect it at the atomic level or the transaction level or the subtransaction level. The answer is yes, you can. The tools are there if you use them judiciously. The traditional means, again, the fringes of the company don't offer granular protection, but where the data lives inside the databases, whatever the version is, there's a way to protect it. What about traditional access control and risk? Data token? Creativity happens at the edge. In, 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 in this view, if you look at that x-axis, small data on the left, big data on the right. Tokenization, it doesn't matter how big your data gets. It's equally as easy to protect it. And that's why this is a flat line on risk. It's also a flat line on cost. Traditional access control, the bigger your data gets, the more it costs to protect it. The bigger, the more routers you have, the more ways to get in. Tokenization and encryption doesn't increase cost, but it increases your security. So when you're doing a business case to put that together, yep, that's a winner. So what you really have to do is protect the misuse of data. And think about selective data protection. And what I've shown in that <clears throat> little uh, database directly above it is a um, schematic of a data warehouse. And, and, the, and the squares in black just represent data that you've protected. Squares and right just represent data that doesn't need to be protected. And so you can have them both live concurrently in the same spot by application so that um, you only have to expend your very scarce protection dollars at the right level. Securing the flow. Again, most of or a lot of big data comes in from source systems. Again, in the center here is is that uh, schematic that kind of represents what big data looks like. And then you've got your large legacy reporting systems over here. So again, protect the data in those source systems that need to be protected. That can flow through the big data systems. It doesn't, big data doesn't know or care whether it's tokenized or encrypted or not. It will store everything. But where it really comes down to being important is in those legacy reporting systems, especially when you start dropping into deeper and deeper levels of reporting. So by the time you wind up reporting uh, at an individual level, and I believe HIPAA laws state that it has to be tokenized uh, to know, uh, when you drop down below 50 uh, individuals or so, tokenization must occur. So uh, it's, it's relatively easy because big data doesn't care, the way you store it doesn't care what it looks like. The reporting system doesn't care what it looks like. So you can report out at, at the levels that you want and very, very rarely do you need to go to the individual level. But all that needs to be protected and stored correctly. So uh, again, if you're not going to, if you're not going to protect it, uh, it's what's known on the left here as data in the clear. Encrypted files for applications, you can do it on a file-based mode. And what you wind up with is just uh, secure data fields that are encoded at living in one spot. So here again, we have big data at the heart of automating security. And so what you need to do is protect your data. Don't, don't protect the access into the company because it doesn't work. You have to do it, yes, but don't spend all of your security resources and your data protection resources at the fringe because they will get in. Protect data where it lives, which is the source systems and the databases that that you have there, and that's that's the way to get an extra set of protection, so that when they do open the door, it doesn't mean anything to them. And that's really, you know, if you 
were looking for if you were looking for some uh, golden answer and here's the here's the tool to buy here's the thing to do um, you're not going to find that uh, we need to go back to when BI was in its infancy a few decades ago and protect the data by doing good data management principles and quality locking down who has access to it locking down the meaning locking down what actually gets protected the traditional protection methods again only go so far the breaches can and will occur and again protect data at the atomic level you can lock down data at the sub transaction level because big data doesn't care how you store it at the end of the day if, if you take one thing away from this it's know your data flow and know your data so when we talk to companies not necessarily about big data but data in general the two things that we always stress are know who's responsible for the data in your company and have people that know how to analyze it and understand what the data is trying to tell you because breaches audits are on the rise and if you don't act now uh, you're putting your company at risk and those in the company that would say it's too expensive they expensive compared to what compared to the data breaches that are that are happening and then put those procedures that are in place to catch abnormal access to data so put those audits in place put those things in there that uh, let you that let you use um, data as as you should let you catch it before uh, the authorities catch it you invert that um, that timeline to catch it you invert who catches it for you and you go back and and someday, hopefully, we'll, we'll have a diagram that shows, well, it takes them months to get in, but we caught it in seconds, and we caught it internally long before our customers or anybody else uh, knew it as well, and that's really, um, that's really the way to go. Um, so I'm going to go uh, and actually go out. We've got a few minutes left. I know there's a couple of questions out there that folks, some folks have, have typed in. Um, can you elaborate on the difference between big data and data warehouse? Um, big data is a catch-all term. Data warehouse as a term is somewhat, uh, I wouldn't say antiquated, but less used than big data. Uh, any, any place you store a large volume of data and, and increment it and report on it, it's a data warehouse. You can call it big data and data warehouse. They're almost synonymous. Um, all big data is, is a data warehouse, but not all data warehouses are big data. Is the ROI worth it to encrypt that data at rest? Or should you rather see uh, similar funds, time and funds spent in user access, logging, and monitoring? Yes, you have to do both. All I'm saying here is that don't spend all of your data. Or don't spend all of your do uh, dollars, your security dollars, just trying to prevent access at the fringes because it hasn't worked. Uh, we, we've seen people get in, and, and once they get in, all security stops. You need security all to the very hard, down to the atomic level data. Make it increasingly hard for someone to get that data. Is it most of the data breach as a result of stolen credentials? Yep. A lot of it is insider access uh, that has a problem. So uh, what do you do? All, all, your, all your security uh, on the fringes doesn't help if, if someone who has stolen it has let the keys go for all of those, those spots. So what do you do? The only way to help prevent that is to limit the number of people that actually have access to it. So uh, you have, that's a fine balancing line between the access to the data uh, out there and, and what the level of the person is. So restrict the most uh, sensitive data just to the very highest levels and to the very small amount of people that can try and contain that problem. And those people that do have access, make sure they have access only to the data they need and uh, the data that's encrypted is encrypted. Uh, I, I have a feeling that most of these companies out there that are dealing with these issues have totally revamped their security policies. I haven't read any of the uh, any of the documentation from the governmental agencies on what the security has to be, but you know that's in the works. Okay, we have time maybe for one more question down here. How do you define what what is BI? Business intelligence. Uh, it's not just reporting, it's not just querying. Business intelligence if you want to define it that way, is really anything that gives you a competitive edge 
in your in your field of, of expertise that you are as a company. It's not just reporting. It's also what you learn about customers internally. So there's internal BI as well as there's external BI. And there's also what you have to report to the street in terms of if you're a publicly traded company, you have very strict guidelines along that for, for business intelligence. So it's not just reporting. It's anything that gives you a competitive advantage or helps you run as a company. Okay, I think that's about it. Um, hopefully you've learned learned something from uh, our experiences in dealing with data security. It is, it is a nascent industry right now, and the best way that people can protect their company and themselves is just to be aware of whenever a report leaves your fingertips to a user, or sensitively lock down your data. There were times uh, in my previous life with a company where uh, you got you got uh, reprimanded if your PC was open or your your terminal was open or reports were left on your desk. Security officers would come by and check. So um, there are ways, and just we need to get more effective and more uh, sensitive about how we protect our data. And we do that. Our, our shareholders will reward us, and we won't face uh, any issues with governmental uh, fines against us. And, and we'll just be better off as an industry if we wind up doing that. Again, thank you all. Uh, thank you all for attending. I hope it's been informative. And please come back and see us. We'll, we'll have other webinars along different topics in, in BI from QAnon. So enjoy your day. Thanks so much.